Welcome to Today at Sideport. I am your gracious host, Greg Andrews, the Planetarium Manager. In this series of videos, we'll be taking a look at the ex different exhibits and a behind the scenes look at the planetarium as well as our observatory, the, all that exists in the Space Center side. This session of series, or I actually say this series of videos, is actually made possible to a grant that was given to us by Verizon Wireless. So we definitely want to extend our gratitude and a big thank you and a shout out to them for helping us out with this. Welcome, thank you for joining us on this presentation of today at SciPort. And this one we will be presenting about the planet of Mars. If you recall in uh, a video, uh, I think from last month, we talked about sort of the distance and the sizes uh, compared, to, compared to the sun. But in this one, we want to exclusively focus on Mars. One thing that is really interesting right now is Mars is literally high in the sky for us. So if you've been going outside at night and the weather allows you, you go outside and you know where to look at night, you can see the planet of Mars and your eyes will hopefully pick up that distinctive reddish, or sometimes my, people might see brown, but usually a reddish color. And that reddish color is actually what made it so easily recognized to ancient cultures and civilizations. When we talk about Mars, you find out that Mars is the Roman god of war. And that came about because the Greeks and Romans thought that the red represented anger if you will, or rage. So they used it to mark their respective deity, uh, or to say, to recognize their respective deity, Aries or Mars. So Mars's reddish color though, is quite interesting. That reddish color is due to rust, okay? And when you think about this, you're like, rust? The answer is yes. Rust comes about from a combination of, the, of iron, and oxygen that combine together. But what's really cool is how this rust forms. More than likely, this rust formed from the presence of water. And when you think about this as well, if you've ever tried to dig a hole into the other side of the world, so to speak, here in Louisiana, you just dig a few feet into the ground and you will encounter reddish dirt. So that same reddish effect that takes place here in Louisiana is also taking effect on the planet Mars. And that's what gives us this wonderful reddish color. So when we examine Mars, one of the things again that makes it so interesting is because for a long time, there were people that literally thought that there was life on Mars. Uh, some of people that observed Mars they looked at Mars through a telescope and they noticed there are these dark markings on there. And these dark markings were thought to be a system of canal systems or irrigation systems that were established on Mars. Well, of course, the only way that comes up is if there is a civilization that exists on Mars. So Mars had this mystique about it for a long time, thinking that there was evidence of life. And then when we sent rovers to Mars and even orbiters to Mars, we did not find any signs of life. But what we did find is evidence of past water. There are all of these other tidbits of evidence on here that says there used to be water on Mars. Mars does not have any liquid water on it, but there is evidence that shows that there was water on this particular planet, roughly speaking about four billion years ago. So what happened to all that water remains a mystery and it's one of the reasons why we continue to explore Mars. We don't want whatever made the water disappear on Mars to take place on Earth. While we talked about the history of Mars, that will help us to lead into the exploration of Mars. So when we first began to explore Mars, we literally did it with our eyes. I mentioned how it was named after the Roman god of Mars, uh, the Roman god Mars, or the Greek god Ares. And observations were limited to just the human eye. After the invention of the telescope, people began to turn to examine Mars through the uses of a telescope. And there was a particular astronomer named Giovanni Schiaparelli. And Mr. Giovanni Schiaparelli ended up 
drawing a map, and it might be difficult to see, but he drew this map here. And in this map, he drew certain features that were taken to mean a canal or irrigation system. So having said that, people began to really wonder and become fascinated with the possibility that there might be life on another planet. So the exploration began. When the space race kicked off on October 4th, 1957, with the launch of the Sputnik satellite, well, that took exploring Mars to a new, new level. Did we send objects to Mars and let them explore the surface there from a remote perspective? And the answer is yes. So although we sent several orbiters by, it wasn't until 1975 when we had the landings of the Viking 1 and Viking 2 probes. And when those particular landing probes landed on Mars, they took a wonderful surveying view of the landscape of Mars, and they saw there was no signs of life. It was a very dry and dusty area. Let's go to talk about getting to Mars now. So here is another sign that is really interesting because what this does is it shows you that getting to Mars is not easy. At any point in time, Mars can be anywhere from 30 million miles away to 300 million miles away. And keep in mind, Earth is moving as well as Mars. So trying to just go a straight line path to the planet of Mars from Earth is impossible. You have to take what is called a trajectory, right? And you have to use the benefits of gravitational pull of the gravitational pull of Earth. So having said that, there is what you call a launch window of Mars. And that launch window is roughly speaking a little over two years. So that means when you are launching something to Mars and you want to have the least amount of travel time and the least amount of fuel that you have to use, you have to do that roughly every two years, okay? So just keep that in mind and we'll talk about that in our next segment that Mars, as beautiful and as great as it may be to explore, it is difficult getting there. You probably have seen this exhibit here at Cyborgs. Hey, first time for that. That was not planned. <laughs> so where you have this spinning wheel, so to speak, or the spinning base, this trackball and this ramp. And the goal is to make these, this ball go into each of these respective colored um, pockets, if you will. Well, you'll notice that the trajectory of the ball gets changed based on where it enters this spinning base. And this is actually, believe it or not, how gravity works. This particular principle is known as a gravitational assist. And this comes in real handy when we are launching satellites or spacecraft out into space and trying to go beyond Earth orbit. We do this for the moon when we go to the moon. Um, we also have done this when we go to Mars. And even when we send satellites going out into other places um, that are going beyond our solar system. So a gravitational assist is really great because, again, it allows you to actually gain a boost and your velocity, right? You may have started going slow and now you get this tug that pulls you because of that particular planet. So this is something, this is one reason why I talked about before the launch window. Um, not only do you have the trajectories of the different planets that have to align accordingly, you also have to account for the gravitational tug of Earth. Hopefully, you have learned something new. You can always, of course, stop and ask the staff. We're willing to uh, provide some more information or some of the background. But thank you for joining us, us for this month's uh, Today at Mars. And stay tuned because we're going to come back with a bonus feature for this month when we highlight the successful landings of the three spacecraft that are taking place this year, this month.